As you just heard, Rose, uh, many heard her say, many, many Americans pay for prescription drugs more money than anywhere in the country. On board Air Force One, the president and I talked about how energized he is to take on Donald Trump, his likely opponent. Biden told me every time he hears Trump speak, he gets, quote, juiced up. This is my video update on this Tuesday morning, March the 12th. Let's talk about some news. And how about that Professor Biden? How about Professor Biden on Air Force One speaking to MSNBC? And Professor Biden revealed that every time he hears Trump speak, he gets juiced up. <laughs> he gets juiced up every time he hears Trump speak. Uh, Professor Biden, he's a handsome man. He's a very handsome man, but every time he hears Trump speak, he just gets juiced up. <laughs> that Professor Biden. So let's talk about a CNN article, an exclusive CNN article that came out yesterday with the title exclusive Russia producing three times more artillery shells than the U.S. and Europe for Ukraine. Three times more artillery shells than the U.S. and Europe combined. That is Russia, the, the country, the gas station masquerading as a country, the gas station masquerading as a country produces three times more artillery shells, more ammo than Europe and the U.S. combined. This is the, the Russia that just six months ago they were telling us was running out of weapons, running out of artillery, running out of missiles, running out of tanks, running out of fighter jets, running out of everything. And now we have a CNN exclusive saying that Russia outproduces by 3x the United States and Europe. This is the Russia that, that was using shovels, using shovels to, to fight the Ukraine military. This is the Russia that Ursula von der Crazy was telling us had to uh, remove chips from from washing machines and using those chips in their tanks and in their fighter jets. That's how, that's how terrible of a situation the Russian military found itself in. They were in tatters, the Russian military, the Russian economy in tatters. And now they are outproducing the United States and Europe three times. What a turnaround, huh? <laughs> what a turnaround from the Russian military. So let's read what uh, CNN is saying here. And, and if CNN is saying three times, three times more they are outproducing the United States and Europe, then uh, it's probably something along the lines of five or six times more. But uh, anyway, here is what CNN is reporting. Russia appears on track to produce nearly three times more artillery munitions than the U.S. and Europe, a key advantage ahead of what is expected to be another Russian offensive in Ukraine later this year. Russia is producing about 250,000 artillery munitions per month, or about 3 million a year, according to NATO intelligence estimates of Russian defense production shared with CNN, as well as sources familiar with Western efforts to arm Ukraine. Collectively, the U.S. and Europe have the capacity to generate only about 1.2 million munitions to send to Kiev, a senior European intelligence official told CNN. So in the first paragraph, CNN admits that Russia isn't even on the offensive. So everything that we've seen from Russia over the past, let's say three months, all the advances defeating the Ukraine uh, big super duper spring summer counteroffensive, uh, capturing Avdevka. All of this has been done on the defensive. Russia has not even gone on the offensive yet, according to 
CNN. And uh, let's continue. The U.S. military set a goal to produce 100,000 rounds of artillery a month by the end of 2025, less than half of the Russian monthly output. And even that number is now out of reach with 60 billion in Ukraine funding stalled in Congress, a senior army official told reporters last week. What, what we are in now is a production war, a senior NATO official told CNN. The outcome in Ukraine depends on how each side is equipped to conduct this war. Officials say Russia is currently firing around 10,000 shells a day, compared to just 2,000 a day for the Ukrainian side. The ratio is worse in some places along the 600-mile front, according to a European intelligence official. So according to CNN, the U.S. military set a goal to produce 100,000 rounds of artillery a month by the end of 2025 less than half the Russian monthly output. If you assume that Russia cannot produce any more than what CNN claims is 250,000 artillery munitions per month, then according to CNN, by 2025, if Russia cannot ramp up production, then by the end of 2025, According to CNN, the U.S. military will, under a best case scenario, under an optimistic scenario, be able to get to 100,000 rounds of artillery a month, less than half of the Russian monthly output. That is, if you assume that Russia will remain static, production will remain static until the end of 2025, which is not going to happen. And Russia is producing a lot more. I believe Russia is producing a lot more than 250,000 munitions per month. A lot more. And it's going to produce a lot more by the end of 2025. So basically, this is an admission from CNN that the collective West cannot and will not match uh, Russia's production of artillery. Not now, not in the short term, and not in the medium term, and probably not in the long term. And they admit that this is a war of artillery, an ammunition war. So if they admit that this war is going to be decided on the, on the basis of who has more ammo, and they admit that the entirety of the collective West will not be able to match Russia, not in one year, not in two years, not in three years, most likely not in five years in terms of ammunition production. Well, then, what's, uh, what's the conclusion? We all know what the conclusion is. Bravo, CNN. You have finally caught up to to what we have been saying on the Duran, on my channel, Alexander's channel, Brian Berletic. Uh, you finally have caught up to our reporting over the last six months, one year, a year and a half. Bravo, CNN, good job. <laughs> good job, CNN. So why is CNN coming out with this article? Why is CNN admitting this? Why are they reporting on this? Why has the, the permanent state, the deep states, why have they given CNN the go-ahead to publish a story like this, which is basically an admission that the collective West and Ukraine cannot win this war? I don't know. I don't know what the reasons are for CNN publishing this article or being, permi or being given permission to publish this article. But it is without a doubt an admission that Ukraine will not and cannot win this conflict. From shovels and, and washing machine chips to outproducing the entirety of the collective West. Not bad for a gas station masquerading as a country, huh? Not bad at all.
So Lindsey Graham, he uh, he made the rounds on U.S. mainstream media the other day, and Lindsey Graham is is now an America First guy. <laughs> How about that? Lindsey Graham is now all about America First. And Lindsey Graham, he told the Collective West mainstream media that he doesn't want to just give $61 billion to Project Ukraine. Not, uh -uh, not, not America first, Lindsey Graham. He doesn't want to give $61 billion to Project Ukraine. Just give it. Just give it away. That's not what America first, Lindsey Graham, is all about. America first, Lindsey Graham. He wants to make sure that America, that America gets something back. That's right. This is America first. Lindsey Graham, he is looking for a cabinet position in Trump's White House. But uh, Lindsey Graham, he said that uh, the United States should loan, should loan the $61 billion to Ukraine. That's right. It should loan the $61 billion to Ukraine because according to Lindsey Graham, the U.S. is already $34 trillion in debt. He said, no one wants to help Ukraine more than me. But we must think about America first. But the idea that we will only give without getting anything back must disappear. That's right. Loan the money to Ukraine because Olensky's good for it. <laughs> He's good for it. Didn't he tell NBC like three months ago in, in what is now, in my opinion, one of the, one of the best uh, interviews of Alensky to date. Didn't he tell NBC that uh, that look, eh, eh, give me, give me credit, give me loan. I pay back money. Give me loan, I pay back money. <laughs> Remember that interview? Yeah, loan him the money. Tr trust me, America. Trust me. I'm telling everyone that's watching from the United States. Uh, trust in Lindsey Graham. Believe me when I tell you. When you loan $61 billion to Olensky, he will pay you back with interest. <laughs> Trust me, he will pay you back with interest. Olensky's, you know, that type of guy. <laughs> so uh, the CIA director, Mr. Burns, Mr. Burns of the CIA, he was speaking to Congress along with Avril D. Haynes, who is the director of national intelligence, and according to the New York Times, they warn of losses for Ukraine without more U.S. aid, without the $61 billion. According to the New York Times, Burns and Haynes are warning big losses for Ukraine. And in this uh, testimony, Burns laid out two scenarios. CIA Burns laid out two, two scenarios connected to the $61 billion to Project Ukraine. Scenario number one, he said, if Ukraine gets the $61 billion, then Ukraine can begin to strike at Crimea. Ukraine can roll back the Russian forces, and uh, by 2025, Ukraine will be able to negotiate with Russia from a position of strength if they get that's $61 billion. But Burns said scenario number two is Ukraine does not get that $61 billion. And then he said we are going to see more towns and cities fall like Avdevka. And this would be a disaster for Ukraine and for the United States of America. So get the $61 billion to Project Ukraine. Give it as a loan. Loan it to Olensky. Loan Olensky the $61 billion, And that $61 billion will accomplish, what, two, three, four hundred billion and 20,000 sanctions could not accomplish. It will, uh, it will lead to the defeat of the Russian military. And, and Burns, Burns was very specific. He said that $61 billion will give Ukraine the ability to hit at Crimea to strike at Crimea. They are fixated, absolutely fixated on Crimea. The collective West, they have connected Crimea to Putin. Crimea is Putin, Putin is Crimea. Hit Crimea, you hit Putin. That's, that's what they've created in their delusional 
combines this connection between Putin and uh, and Crimea. But uh, that is what Burns told Congress and uh, and the android AI robot known as Budanov, who is the military's intel chief. He also said that Ukraine is planning a big a big operation towards Crimea. That is what he posted on social media. And the reason he put out this post on social media is because there is, uh, or there was, a documentary film that aired the other day in Ukraine called War for the Sea. And in this documentary film, it, it highlights Ukraine's Black Sea victory. That's what this documentary is about. The, the great victory on the Black Sea from the Ukraine military. And Budanov said, and I quote, these are all preparatory measures for a serious operation in Crimea. In addition, it is a good message for the population that has been living under occupation for 10 years. Many of them believe that they have been forgotten. So according to Budanov, Everything that has been happening in the Black Sea is just a preparation for what will be a very big operation. And according to Budanov, it will be the liberation of Crimea because in Budanov's mind, all the people in Crimea, they have been waiting for the Alensky regime to liberate them for the last 10 years. That is what Budanov said. And uh, Pavel of the Czech Republic, President Pavel, he came out with a statement the other day and he said that sending NATO troops into Ukraine would uh, not be against international law. It would not break international law because those troops would be invited by Ukraine into, into Ukraine. The Alensky government would invite those troops into Ukraine and thus it would be completely legit. So that is what Pavel said the other day, quote, there is a clear difference between the deployment of combat forces and the engagement of the army in auxiliary tasks. Instead of training security officers in NATO countries, instructors could be sent directly to Ukraine, Czech President Peter Pavel said. So the plan that Pavel is floating out there, and I think this is a very, very possible scenario. Do not discount this scenario. I think this is indeed a possible uh, scenario that Macron and Pavel and the Baltic states and, and uh, Poland, I think they're kicking this one around as a possible intervention into Ukraine. This scenario, <laughs> the scenario, <laughs> people get mad when I repeat myself, but <laughs> it's, it's, how I, it's how I keep track of all the news. So uh, if you're mad when I repeat myself, I apologize. But <laughs> the scenario is that these uh these collective west soldiers or nato nato soldiers or collective west whatever countries want to partake in this operation they would be invited by uh by ukraine into the country so it would not be breaking international law and what they would do in ukraine is one of two scenarios and uh, simplicius the thinker he put out an article the other day on his Substack where he outlines these scenarios, so go check it out. He gets into more detail than what I'm gonna give you right now in this video. But the two scenarios are that these forces would come in, and as Pavel said, they would, uh, they would take up auxiliary tasks. So they would relieve Ukraine soldiers from tasks that they are, they are performing in the, uh, in, uh, in the rear operations that they are performing and they would relieve them so that they can then move to the front lines. So that's the first scenario and that would free up soldiers to go into the front lines because all of the operations that are taking, that are taking place in, uh, in Ukraine away from the front lines would then be handled by these collective West NATO forces. The second scenario is that these NATO forces would go to the border with Belarus and they would relieve 
Ukraine soldiers currently stationed on the border in Belarus who are acting as uh, as a defensive line against the possible uh, incursion from Belarus or from the north of uh, of Ukraine. And so they would they, they would relieve the Ukraine forces in the north stationed in the north to then be sent to the front lines. And under international law, you could make the argument that if Russia were to hit these collective West NATO forces, which are in a non, you could say a non-combatant role, then it could uh, it could be the trigger for uh, for NATO to to take a, a combative, a military uh, role in Ukraine if Russia were to hit these soldiers in. Uh, in Ukraine under under this scenario that Pavel is is laying out there. So that uh, th that's a possible that's a possible scenario. But you know, uh, Russia has said multiple times, dozens of times, that any soldiers entering Ukraine from NATO from the collective West will be defined will be seen as enemy combatants even if those soldiers are, are performing auxiliary tasks or if they're just manning the posts on, uh, on, on the border between Belarus, Russia has come out and said, even Peskov yesterday, yesterday he even said that this is not a good idea and any collective West troops in Ukraine will be seen as taking part in this conflict. So that could be the tripwire. This could be the tripwire that Macron and Pavel and the Baltic states are, are looking for. And the argument that they could be making is we're sending troops into Ukraine. They're not, uh, they're not engaging with the Russian military. We were invited into Ukraine. And all of a sudden, the Russian military attacked these, these NATO soldiers and Article 5 and, you know, where... This all goes. So anyway, that's just a scenario that I'm putting out there, but that seems to be what uh, Pavel is talking about. So uh, Schultz, Olaf Schultz, Pirate Schultz, he was meeting, I believe, with the Malaysian Prime Minister, Prime Minister, the President, uh, the other day. And uh, Schultz, he said that under no circumstances Will Taurus missiles be sent to Ukraine? Not even with uh, Lord Cameron and Annalena 360's circular, circular exchange idea. He said it's not going to happen. Uh, Taurus missiles will not end up in Ukraine. Actually, with the circular exchange idea, it's Storm Shadow missiles that get sent to Ukraine. What am I thinking? Yeah, Taurus gets sent to the UK and then the UK sends Storm Shadow missiles. So, so that's a possible uh, scenario. But Olaf Schultz said that Taurus missiles Taurus missiles will not be in Ukraine. That is what he said. No Taurus missiles in Ukraine. And the reason that Olaf Schultz gives for no Taurus missiles in Ukraine is because uh, he said that the Ukraine military would not be able to operate the Taurus missiles. He says it would need German soldiers to operate the Taurus missiles. And therefore, this is uh, impossible. It's not going to happen, according to... Ola Schultz, and it's an interesting statement from Schultz because, once again, it is a type of, of admission from Schultz indirectly that uh, when it comes to the scalp or storm shadows or maybe even attack missiles that may end up in Ukraine, but these long-range missiles in Ukraine must be operated by NATO military. Anyway, that is the statement from Schultz. Uh, Stoltenberg, so much news today, Stoltenberg... He was at the Sweden NATO ceremony, welcoming Sweden into NATO, and Stoltenberg said that Ukraine must be independent, must find its independence. We must continue to strengthen Ukraine to show Russian President Putin that we will not get that he will not get what he wants on the battlefield, but must sit down and negotiate a solution where Ukraine is recognized and prevails as a sovereign, independent nation, according to 
Stoltenberg, Putin's objective was less NATO and more control over his neighbors and to destroy Ukraine as a sovereign state. Stoltenberg insisted that Russia has failed because NATO is bigger and stronger and Ukraine is closer to NATO membership than ever before. Right. So the narrative is that overall Putin failed in his objective to destroy NATO because now NATO has two new members. So Putin, you failed. <laughs> you failed in your objective. But uh, yeah, I think Stoltenberg, he's, uh, he's missing the point about Ukraine. Ukraine lost its sovereignty and, it, and its independence in 2014 with the Maidan coup. So I don't know what he's talking about when he says that Ukraine has to find its independence and sovereignty. That was lost 10 years ago when the collective West and uh, Newland with her cookies overthrew the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych. So that's my response to Stoltenberg. And let's now talk about what I consider to be a very interesting story, which has to do with the Boeing whistleblower. So a Boeing whistleblower was found dead in the United States. Now, Boeing has been going through a very, very difficult time. Many, many planes, many Boeing planes are uh, malfunctioning, or at least that's how it looks. And you had this whistleblower who was working with the company for 32 years. He retired in 2017. And he was, I'm trying to see, what was his position? Let me go to the BBC here. A former Boeing employee, known for raising concerns about the firm's production standards, has been found dead in the United States. In the days before his death, he had been giving evidence in a whistleblower lawsuit against the company. Boeing said it was saddened to hear of Mr. Barnett's passing. The Charleston County coroner confirmed his death to the BBC on Monday. It said the 62-year-old died from a self-inflicted wound on the 9th of March, and police were investigating. Barnett had worked for the U.S. plane giant for 32 years until his retirement in 2017. I believe he was like a quality control manager. I think that was his position at Boeing. And he retired. He was with the company for 32 years, and he was uh, testifying about all of the problems that Boeing has. And he was found dead. Can you imagine if this happened in, in Russia? Can you imagine what the media would be saying if something like this happened in Russia? Like some whistleblower for some company was found dead. We actually have the we actually have a case like that where you have like an executive from Gazprom was found dead and all of a sudden the, the collective West media is like Putin, Putin killed him. <laughs> now you have now you have the, the same exact thing unfolding at Boeing. And uh, this is very, very suspicious, though. He might have died. Might have died. I don't know. Self-inflicted is what the BBC is saying. He died from self-inflicted wound, according to the BBC. So you, you now have the, the same thing of, of, of what happened maybe like six months ago with the gas prom. Uh, manager, you have the same thing happening now in the United States with Boeing. But they're not saying this was any type of foul play or anything like that, right? <sighs> Boeing, Boeing having some really, really, really tough times. Very, very difficult times for Boeing. Boeing placed sanctions on Russia, didn't they? Yeah. Boeing, Airbus, they put sanctions on Russia. Anyway, let's, uh, let's do a couple of more stories. I think this video is going long. Yeah, I got to wrap things up. So uh, let's see, uh, Haiti, things are moving fast in Haiti. We got the news that uh, the Prime Minister Ariel Henry has resigned. So uh, that's the latest update from Haiti. And Annalena, Annalena 360, she came out with a comment connected to the Pope's uh, white flag statement and uh, the Ukraine white flag surrender statement. And Annalena said that she didn't understand the Pope's stance. She didn't understand why the Pope 
has taken this stance for peace. Why would, why would the Pope take, take a stance for peace? I just don't get it. I, you know, I would imagine that the Pope would say more war, <laughs> but I don't know, <laughs> you know. Why would the Pope call for peace? Why, why would the, 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 the leader of the Catholic Church, this religious figure, want peace? It doesn't make any sense. I, I, Annalena doesn't understand it. I don't understand it. <laughs> Oh, boy. She said, we must stand by Ukraine and do everything we can to ensure that it can defend itself. That is what Annalena said, replying to the Pope's call for negotiations and for Ukraine to raise the white flag because Ukraine cannot win this conflict. So that's Annalena 360. And let's do a clown world and we'll wrap this video up. The UK Sun, they wanted to, to do a, a promo piece on the UK Challenger tank. And from what I understand, they, they were in a Challenger tank at a training ground. I think this is a training ground in the UK, though I'm not quite sure. Maybe it's a training ground in Ukraine. I'm not sure where this training ground, where this training ground is uh, located but uh, british journalists were filming a story about the challenger 2 tank in ukraine and okay so this was in ukraine but the 64 ton vehicle got stuck in the mud at the training ground so it looks like the sun sent journalists to ukraine at some training ground for the challenger 2 tank the wonder weapon challenger 2 tank and as the tank was moving through this training ground, it got stuck in the mud. <laughs> the Wonder Weapon Challenger 2 tank. All right, everybody, that is the video. Embarrassing, huh? Embarrassing for the Challenger 2s. The Wonder Weapon. That is the video, everybody, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. 15% off all t-shirts. Like this video, share this video, subscribe to this channel. Take care.